Good evening. Welcome to the joint meeting of the Budget Finance Committee and the Select Board as we discuss the budget of our next fiscal year. Uh, first up, we would like to have approval of the minutes. I make a motion to approve the minutes of uh, November 27th, 2018, as amended. Second. second. I have first, any second? Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. First up tonight, we have um, directors from the MMA that I'd like to make a presentation. Um, I'm going to stand to the, at the pat, at pro podium. Um, please give us your name and your position with MMA before you start. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Steve Gold. I'm the Executive <coughs> Director of the Maine Municipal Association. And with me this evening is Eric Conrad, who's our Director of Communication and Educational Services. Thank you to the Budget and Finance Committee and the Select Board for having us this evening. We appreciate the opportunity. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of the Maine Municipal Association. We've provided you with packets with general information about MMA in them, and uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at those. If you have questions, please jump in as, as we give you this uh, overview of MMA. I want to start by drawing your attention to a single page document that's in the packet, which is really the cliff notes, if you will, of MMA's strategic and business plan for this current year, 2019. And I just want to draw your attention to our mission at the top of the page. And our mission is very straightforward. It's essentially to provide services and programs to main cities and towns, trying to meet the needs of those cities and towns. And secondly, to be advocates for the common interests of those municipalities in Maine before the state legislature and the federal government. I will tell you that MMAs as an organization is a mission-driven organization. We focus on that very simple mission statement. And we're also a member-driven organization in that everything we do is directed and guided by the members of the organization. And I'll talk a bit more about this as I talk about some of the services and programs. Uh, we do offer a wide variety of services and programs. We think that the town of Raymond would find value in those services and programs should you choose to become a member of the association. And I'll start by talking about our legal services program. We have six attorneys on staff whose jobs are to provide assistance to our members with legal inquiries that they may have from members of boards and committees, but also staff members. Uh, they publish manuals. They publish uh, information packets on issues that are, are uh, new laws, for example. We have a, a vast amount of information, for example, on the new marijuana, adult use, and medical marijuana laws. Uh, they keep up to date on those new laws, and they do training for our members uh, throughout the state on, on these issues. But the important part of what they do is really that they answer about 5,000 legal inquiries every year from the members. And it may be the clerk calling up with an election question. It may be a board member calling about a warrant article uh, and, and drafting before a town meeting, for example. But that's one of the services that is available to our members, is access to those six very experienced municipal attorneys who know land use, they know election laws, they know uh, uh, just virtually every statute in 30A that, that applies to municipalities they're familiar with and, and can assist you with. A second area of uh, services and programs are personnel services. We do labor negotiations for municipalities. We help municipalities recruit town and city managers. But we also have an individual who's very experienced in labor law and personnel matters that's available to our members should they have questions that come up with hiring uh, uh, or firing of, of employees, for example. They're, this individual is there to assist our members with those kinds of questions and inquiries. 
Uh, our advocacy program is a big part of what we do. It's a big part of our mission, as I said. Uh, we have a 70-member legislative policy committee that sets the direction that the staff takes when they are at the State House advocating on behalf of our members' interests. The 70 members are elected from each of the state's 35 Senate districts, two individuals elected by the municipalities within that state Senate district to serve on the, as their representative to the Legislative Policy Committee. They meet monthly during the legislative session to go through a list of bills uh, that uh, staff has identified of, of being concern or interest to municipalities in the state. And it's a completely open democratic process where, again, being a member-driven organization, they set the policy for, for the uh, advocacy staff who, who are going over to the State House and, and uh, representing municipal interest. Uh, it's, it's always a lively discussion. Uh, it's a majority vote. Uh, it's really a, almost like the legislature, a microcosm, in fact, of the, uh, uh, of the State Senate. And uh, they set the tone, they set the policy for how we approach our advocacy efforts. So again, member driven. Uh, I'm gonna ask Eric to come up quickly and talk about our publications, our training <coughs> programs, and our website that are of value to our members. So good evening, I'm Eric Conrad. I'm the Director of Communication and Training. I may have been there by MMA standards not very long, nine years. And I know some of you from, from our workshops we've had over the years. Um, just a real quick one down of our department. Uh, there's eight of us. We, we, we host about 95 training events around the state each year. I was looking at the list on the way down here uh, tonight. We're in Westbrook, we're in Wyndham, we're in Freiburg, we're in uh, Bridgeton this year. We'd love to be in Raymond next year. Um, at all kinds of issues, but some of them are particularly relevant. I think the lakefront communities, and I'll give you a couple examples. Aerial drones is coming up next week. Uh, those are fun toys, but in a quiet, I live on a lake, and a quiet lakefront resort is something to know know something about and how far you can regulate that. That workshop is next week. Um, we have something on, on best practices for vacation rentals, VRBO, Airbnb kind of things that are popping up, and as you probably read in the Portland Press Herald, quite an issue in South Portland. So not only do we do the standard elected officials workshops, planning board workshops that we do every year because those positions turn over with every election, but we really try to do some off the news ones that could be of real value to a town like Raymond. Uh, we do a monthly magazine that about 4,400 people like you around the state get every year. It's called Main Town and City. Great stuff. We just had a two-part uh, series by George Mitchell and Olympia Snow on civility, uh, how to conduct civil town, state, and federal government from their perspective over the years. I think it was really uh, well done. Our big training events, I'm going to leave the packets with you tonight. I don't have it on your table. I'll just leave on the chair as I go. But we have an annual convention that draws about 1,200 people a day over a two-day period. Uh, that will be in Bangor this year. A technology conference, obviously that's something that towns and cities, and you guys do a great job here being aware of. Uh, and an HR management conference that we started four years ago because of the continuing sort of uh, pressing needs about towns and cities, managing their resources very carefully, managing people very well, cost-effective kind of management too. Um, I just want to, before I turn it back over to Steve, uh, just just tell you a little bit, you know, in, in my view, MMA in nine years, so I'm 57, so I didn't come here at the beginning of my career, as you can probably guess, but MMA is the kind of organization that if you join, the more you ask of us, the more you will get out of it. And I can guarantee you that you will view it as a wise investment. It's not that much in the scheme of things, and you, the value of our legal services, our insurance products, which Steve's going to talk about in a minute, you will absolutely not regret your decision is a great organization. I've only been there nine years, but I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, and and it, and we love to have you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Eric did mention our group insurance programs, which, as a member of the association, you would have the opportunity to explore, uh, and those include our risk management services programs, which are our property and casualty risk pool program, which covers municipal liability. Uh, buildings, content, vehicles, uh, all of those, cyber liability coverage, covers drones now, for example. Uh, those programs are available, as well as the main municipal employee health trust programs, which provides a variety of employee benefit programs to our members. From health insurance plans, there are seven of them, seven options that are available to, to the health trust members, to dental insurance, vision, 
insurance, life insurance, and short-term disability insurance are available to the members of the, of the health trust as well. And, and I'm not going to get into detail about those, those programs, but I will mention some common elements that they have. These programs were created in response to our members. Again, going back, back to that theme of, of member-driven organization. Our members were having difficulty a number of years ago obtaining particularly liability coverage when the market became very restricted. Uh, when health insurance costs started to go through the roof a number of years ago, our members were struggling trying to find affordable quality coverage. So they turned to us and asked us to create these, these group insurance programs. They are self-funded programs, self-insured programs. The trust and the risk pool retain the risk. We don't send that off to an insurance carrier, for example. However, we do purchase what's called reinsurance and stop loss coverage to protect those pools from large claims that may exceed a certain limit. Uh, our administrative costs are very low. We do a lot of the administration in-house. We find we can do it less expensively and provide better service to our members. For example, participants in our health trust are about 20,000 lives we cover around the state of Maine. If they have a question about their insurance coverage, they call our office in Augusta and get a live body. We have a small call center, if you will, of staff members who really advocate on behalf of those employees and helping them work their way through insurance coverages and understand what their benefits are. Uh, the programs have a proven track record of stability and longevity. Uh, the workers' compensation program has been in uh, been around since 1978, the property and casualty program since 87, the health trust since 1983. We really have had a strong, financially sound, conservatively funded program that, that we offer the members through the group insurance and the health trust. And the programs are tailored to the needs of municipalities. For example, the property and casualty program takes into account the limits of liability and protections afforded by the Maine Tort Claims Act for our members. And we're always changing the coverages that are available to our members. I mentioned drone coverage. That's something that, you know, five years ago was, was not even something that we were thinking about covering. But more and more municipalities are, are utilizing drones, and we, we have added that as a, as a coverage, as well as cyber liability. It's an area that's new and a coverage area that's new, for example. So these programs are there for the members. We rely on professional outside advisors, actuaries, accountants, uh, benefit advisors, attorneys, in the case of the risk pool programs, to assist us in, in meeting the obligations that uh, the trustees and the board members have for those programs, their fiduciaries. And we are in full compliance with state and federal laws and, and make sure that we're uh, following uh, the Federal Affordable Care Act and state laws that pertain to workers' compensation and property and casualty risk pool programs. We talked about the core services of legal, of, of publications mm -hmm. and training. I mentioned our personnel services, our advocacy on behalf of the members, and our group insurance programs. We think we provide a full array of services and programs to our members, and we're always looking to our members to find out what their emerging needs are so that we can look at new programs and services to try to meet those needs. And that's an ongoing practice of our strategic and finance committee. That, in a nutshell, is I know, very high overview of the Maine Municipal Association. I just wanted to make sure we left enough time for questions that you may have. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, at this time, I will open the floor to questions. I ask that you please be recognized before delivering your question. Are there any questions for either Stephen or Eric? Brian? Uh, Mr. Gove, how many cities and towns within Maine are, are members of MMA? Uh, we have currently 485 members out of 490 municipalities. 485 out of 490? Yes. So there's five towns like Raymond or cities? Or yeah, there are, well, there are, uh, Raymond's the largest. Uh, there are, are a handful of very small uh, 
communities of fewer than 100 people that are in rural parts of the state. And two of you are at the <coughs> Yes. Um, and on the advocacy part is, uh, area, is there something that you could point to as a tangible outcome of what MMA did that was beneficial to towns and cities in Maine? Sure. Uh, a couple. Uh, we've been fighting for the restoration of state municipal revenue sharing program. Um, we're pleased that the governor's budget includes an increase in revenue sharing. That's been one of the primary planks of the Legislative Policy Committee for years, trying to restore revenue sharing to the 5% statutory level that, that uh, is, is provided for. We're still working on that issue. Uh, another example is um, the enactment of adult use marijuana and uh, medical marijuana. We worked very hard with uh, working with the legislature's task force that was looking at implementing adult use and ensured that we have an opt-in provision that municipalities have to take action to allow any kind of commercial retail growing of adult use and medical marijuana in Maine. And uh, we thought that that was uh, a tr tremendous victory for local control and home, home rule, that you have to opt in mm -hmm. rather than taking steps to prevent. Thank you very much. Julie, you had your question. Ryan covered it. Excellent. Thank Anyone you. else? Yeah. Josh? Yes, sir. Um, how are your dues assessed? Are they assessed by population or real estate value? Or? It's, it's uh, both. 50% uh, <coughs> population, 50% state valuation. Did you have an estimate of Raymond's uh, I did. It's, it's $7,659. That's this document. Yes. Sorry, $7,659? Yes. Yeah, that's this one. Uh, that's a sample. Okay, uh, you're pretty yeah, close then. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Kevin Oliver, uh, what's the membership like? Is it an annual dues or? Yes. Okay. It's an annual dues. The dues notices go out in late December and uh, invoices go out in early January. We're on a calendar year. Okay. It is built into this fiscal year budget for discussion purposes, so it is incorporated into the budget draft. Yeah. <laughs> what parts of it are, are you looking at the insurance? The membership dues only, the base only? dues. Okay. We continue with our private sector insurance and, uh, and our private sector solutions for all of our other services. So just the base dues are in there. We used to be a member? Yes. And chose to not be a member anymore? Why? It's... Uh, it's a, it's a somewhat long story, but I could uh, try to give you the Reader's Digest version. I, I guess probably a difference in philosophy, maybe, would be one way to look at it. And, uh, you know, we, we had a, a person who was on the governing board, and, you know, he um, came back, I think, with a legitimate concern after a, a meeting. And uh, it was in the, in the time of Pileski and Tabor, tax limiting legislation. And he was looking for a, a different way of uh, the Legislative Policy Committee operating. And I, and I don't think that he, that he felt he got a very respectful reception from that process, not MMA in particular, but, but the process. And there was a thought that, you know, perhaps MMA should have stepped in and been a, you know, I guess intervened in that, that discussion and, you know, maybe advocated for the notion that, you know, a difference of opinion is okay. And, and uh, so anyway, he came up on the, on the losing end of that. and, and uh, you know, I don't think he was treated very respectfully by another municipal official, not an elected official, but an appointed official. And so I think that left a sort of a bad taste in our mouth about, about the MS, MMA advocacy program. I don't think there's been any quarrel with the notion that the legal services are a good program. I think the Health Trust is an excellent program. The Property Casualty Liability Program is an excellent program. But, but I, so we don't really have any, any difference of opinion with any of that stuff. And, uh, but I think that the, the catalyst for us leaving was a bad experience on the Legislative Policy Committee by one of our elected officials, and I think a legitimate one. And I, at the time, I called the Executive Director and said, this is a serious problem. You need to address it. And he assured me he would. 
and I think the addressing would have been a call to that elected official with an apology on behalf of the association. It did not occur. So that was a, that's the real Reader's Digest version of why we're not a member. Um, how, how long ago? Well, Steve says 10 years, and so I'll buy that. It's been 10 years. But it was, it was an unfortunate you know, occurrence in time, and we have, over the 10 years, looked at becoming a member again. <coughs> so it's not the first time that we, we've, I think we've solicited bids from MMA. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I have, personally, have nothing uh, against MMA, but I do think in the instance of this, uh, this interaction that the elected official from Raymond was due an apology. And, uh, and that we, we should respect differences of opinion. But perhaps MMA, I mean, they're the governing, well, not the governing body, but the, the overarching entity that, o that puts together that, that legislative forum to establish um, the initiatives that the, they should advocate uh, for. But maybe they don't control the, the dialogue. And so, so you could, I guess, say that and, and say that, you know, it was one municipal official versus another municipal official in a bad day, but but I, I think that they should have done something at the time. Yes. Thank you. I believe that uh, we currently pay market rates for MMA training, isn't that correct? I know as a new plan board member, you know, we were new members of elected <coughs> members get, you know, information about attending MMAs and we pay full market price for those training sessions here in Raymond. Right, um, if I could, I'll address that. So uh, the way it works is if you're a member and you go to a workshop and it's $45 a member rate, you're paying twice that, uh, to be honest with you. Um, a couple point, I just want to make a point, if you don't mind me following up on what Steve said, on the marijuana thing, we did not push for the legalization of marijuana. <laughs> that was hoisted upon us, just yeah. like it was hoisted upon you. But what we did successfully push for is, I think, the strongest home rule uh, statute in the United States. Yeah. We were right there, and, and you either opt in or you don't have legal marijuana in your community. And may had a lot to do with that. Um, and then the other point I wanted to make is, we're, Steve and I are making tangible points tonight about how you can financially recoup the cost of your dues, but maybe the best point is the intangible. You come to our events and you're going to be part of a thousands of municipal officials. You're going to be getting best practices <coughs> from not neighboring towns, but from Madawaska to Kittery at our events, and you can bring all that knowledge back home. It's hard to, I can't quantify that for you, but I will tell you when we have our convention and we have our workshops, the number one thing they say that they get value out of it. We have great speakers too, don't get me wrong but it's meeting fellow people like you who are in the same situations, facing the same issues all across Maine. Mr. Chairman, if I may, and Don and I have had conversations about what happened 10 years ago, and I, I have told him that I'm truly sorry for, for that. Uh, but let me tell you just a little bit more about the legislative policy process. Um, as I said, it 70 member committee, they discuss, they vote, it's majority rule, but I can tell you that uh, from my experience over a number of years of sitting in those meetings and af actually staffing them many years ago, that my experience is that the dialogue is open, it's respectful, and differing viewpoints are accepted, heard, and considered. Uh, we have a diversity of municipal officials from various sized communities around the state. We have the mayor of the city of Portland sitting there with a select woman from the town of Solon. Uh, and compromise does happen. I'm not going to tell you that you're going to be in 100 percent agreement with everything that the Legislative Policy Committee may, t what positions they may take, but I would hope that you would respect the process as 485 of our members do respect the process that is open, that is uh, compromised, uh, compromising, uh, and, and uh, transparent and very open, honest discussions about these very difficult issues that, that our members face. I have two questions. The first one's really quick, so I'll ask that first of you, and uh, I apologize if this is a silly question, but the, as a member of the MMA, is our attendance at these events like included in the dues, or is there additional charges to go to a conference or event? There are additional charges. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, largely, if you, like, that's what that's a facility and food charge largely. Yeah. Like forty-five dollars to get into an event and get served dinner is is that's that's a lot of it. 
Sure. Okay. And then the second one was more directed kind of at like Don or the Raymond folks here. In the past when we were a member, I totally understand that uh, there are some things you can't put a price on as far as the value and the information that you get from some of the networking events and things like that. But is anybody that's been here back when we were a member, did we seem to recognize, you know, a payback on that dues? You know, the, the money that we paid in dues, did we see that value back in return while we were a member? I wasn't a member. You broke the no. Were you back? I, th I think the staff would. I think the staff would would probably say yes. I know former town clerk Louise Lester's here. She wrote a letter. I think I, I sent that along, uh, in support of uh, MMA. But I mean, to me, MMA is a package, and you look at the the base dues and and the base services that were covered, and I and I think there's value there. But it's a the larger issue is, and and of course we've now been a number of years with private sector services that are you know, more cost effective, I guess. And, uh, but you could certainly, from time to time, take a look at what's offered at MMA as well, and we've done that, even as a non-member. But uh, to me, the, the, the full package, the property casualty, um, you know, risk pool, plus the health program, plus the dues, equals MMA in my mind. So um, that, that's, that, that's the part that is, is the meat of MMA to me, are the other programs, the big programs. I mean, as far as legal services, it's a nice thing to have. Um, and it's helpful, and it probably saves a few dollars, but it's, it's not something they're going to go to court with you with, on, a, on a case or something like that. So, it's, so I mean, it's a, it's a nice, it's a handy thing if you if you're particularly if you're new in the business. I remember when I first started 37 years ago, it was handy to be able to call them and say, "How do you do this? How do you do that?" S simple questions, and they answer those very quickly and efficiently. Um, you know, their programs, their training programs are good, <coughs> and uh, I think you're very topical to the events of the day as they've outlined and. And uh, so, I, as I said, no, no quarrel with any of that stuff. But to me, MMA has always been the full package. And so it's we've been out now 10 years. And so we've, we've gone a long distance from the full package in some of the initiatives that we have done. So um, the base dues, I mean, it's, what is it, would you say, $7,000? 76. 76. So that isn't, that isn't a great deal of money. <coughs> I think in the Raymond way, the Raymond way, we'd probably, if we joined, we'd, and that was all we did, we'd, we use seventy seven, seventy six hundred dollars worth of services somehow. Yeah. <laughs> sure, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Stephen and Eric. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, you, for thank you for your time. You. Thank you. Let me just close by saying we would welcome the town of Raymond as a member of Maine Municipal Association, and I'd reiterate that I think you would get the value of your dues, uh, dues dollars, and we thank you for your time this evening. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to say something, but it's not. And good luck with your budget. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to take things out of order here and have the Raymond Village Library come up first. Um, their paperwork is on page 24, and then the the, the substantiation or whatever is um, from page 68 to 76. Good for the record state you sure. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lee Walker. I know most of you, but some of you I don't. I am the treasurer of the Raymond Village Library. Um, and I'd like to just start with an opening statement, and then we have a few people that have come tonight to speak on behalf of the library. I'd like to give them a few minutes, and then I can open it up to any questions that you all have. Um, so the question tonight really is about what does the town want the library to be? What is the select board? What is the town manager? and the people of Raymond want the library to be. Do they want the library to be a community asset? Um, it is a place that is perceived as neutral for all to come into, uh, strives to serve all members of the community, provides traditional library services and programming and support for town residents, 
It provides programs and activities that are seen as community center functions in other towns, things that a community center might do, we, d we take on. Um, and we are coordinating with other organizations so that um, we can have self-funding um, organ uh, programs that don't add to the cost of the library. So we have Raymond Arts Alliance, we have, which works on programming for the arts um, for the town, and the community garden uh, is another one where we have a Raymond community garden that's, there's no cost at all to the town for that, um, that allows people to come and garden. Um, and there's a age-friendly organization that is helping out with programming for our older citizens, and all of that is, does not incur any additional cost to the library. But they work with the library, the library supports them, we support them, uh, not financially, but with other resources. Huh? Um, so the question is, do we want to continue in the direction with the town support, or should we adjust to less support now and in the future? We recognize that funding is a challenge. Reducing budgets on paper is fairly simple, but the consequences to the people of Raymond would be very painful. Um, we have worked diligently to ensure that the library is in solid financial position. Several years ago, um, the library was overspending. They weren't being good fiscally responsible. We have worked really hard on finding funding sources so that we can maintain our services and build for the future as well. Um, until that, prior to our being able to coordinate all of this, um, we were one failure away from closure. If we had to get a new roof, we didn't have the funds for it. You know, there were things that could have popped up that could have really jeopardized our ability to function. Um, so we have developed a capital plan so that we have reserved money that we were fortunate enough to receive in a grant that um, will provide funding for things as a new roof, new um, heat sources, uh, new windows if we need them, any of those kinds of really kind of quick you know, we've got a problem, we need to fix it quickly, and we've got the funding now to take care of those items, or we're building that, we're building those funds, but we've gotten a very good, substantial piece of that in place now. Um, so we are asking, our increase is really centered around um, our, our payroll needs that we, along with other organizations, have been um, managing through these mandatory wage increases. Uh, for the last two years, we've been able to work that out on our own. We have not come to the town for those increases. We've managed that, um, but we are continuing to face another few years this year and next year um, with those increased costs. Uh, we are using our volunteers. A lot of times people say, why aren't you using more volunteers? We, do have, we did have 17 volunteers last year that worked over 900 hours, and that does not include the volunteer hours that our board puts in. Um, one of our board members manages all of our publicity. Um, obviously, I'm doing the treasurer position. Um, so there are people, there's another person on the board who manages all of the repairs, like short-term repairs on the building, little things that need to be fixed. And all we have to deal with is just the cost of doing that fixing uh, of the materials because he comes in and actually will sand the thing, paint it, repair whatever it is. So we really work very hard to try to use whatever resources we have internally as a group of volunteers to reduce those costs to the library. Um, we are really looking for an additional 12 hours to our current staff. So um, right now our uh, children's librarian is uh, works for 15 hours a week. So she has two programs. The, baby time and the preschool time. She designs the programs, she gets all of the materials for the program, she performs the program, she cleans up from the program, and she still has to, you know, she also was responsible for ordering the children's books. So she does a lot in that 15 hours, and there's no way that we can expand anything that we do to that children population without expanding her hours. Um, and we do have volunteers who come in and help work with her, but she still has a lot on her plate. Um, so she is one person, and then we also have a second librarian whose hours we wanted to add a few more hours to her as well. She is the, one of the people who manages a lot of, not only all of our staff does as well as volunteers, but manages a lot of the program that's not specifically for children. Um, so unfortunately, we do a very good job of looking for grants 
for programming, actually, I'll kind of come back to that in a minute, but the grants that when we go out to look for grants, they're un non-existent for salaries. Um, you can get grants for all kinds of things, but they're not going to pay your people. So that's where we really kind of get stuck in terms of being able to um, find external funds to help build up these programs that we're trying to do. Uh, so we have increased our grant writing, and our success is due to moving from traditional library operations into positioning the library as a leader in the community and creating these um, these partnerships with people. So one example um, is on yeah. our age-friendly initiatives. Uh, we've done an age-friendly garden, uh, which is going to be connected to the community garden. It won an AARP National Grant Challenge. We got a donation of materials from Hancock Lumber to build um, some benches. The Lions came in and they built the benches for us. We have the Garden Club and the Beautification Committee who pitches in. Um, we have master gardeners from Cumberland County who come in and help at the garden with programming and education. Uh, and we also, the garden also will be doing library program this summer. So there's that combination. We looked at Jordan Small to have some students who helped us design a drip irrigation system for these beds that we have that are stand-up gardening beds for people who don't have the physical ability to get down on the ground and do gardening. Um, and we have all of our volunteers that support all of that. So that's just one example where we're pulling all these people from the community to create this one program to happen. Um, so the other thing that we're doing is uh, we have a donor recognition program. We are creating uh, the Betty McDermott Memorial Gazebo, uh, which will be have a memorial plaque on it for people who um, uh, donate. And there's a development of a bequest brochure that we sent that we sent out last year uh, to help try to get those additional funds in. We go directly to other companies to help donate. We were able to get some funding from Dialectic for some new computers that we really ne needed because our technology had been so outdated. So we're constantly going out into the community to try to pull pieces of things in that we know we can get a direct donation for. Um, so that's sort of where we are. If you look, hopefully you got a chance to read the letter. Uh, it talks about <coughs> the different um, uh, requests. I know that Don has put in our request, which would include not only the increase in the funding because of the um, increase in the minimum wage, but it also would allow us to add those extra 12 hours to our staff so that we could expand the program that we're trying to do to hit some of the people that we are not currently able to serve. I have a few people who would like to come up and talk to you briefly about um, their uh, views on the library, and then I'll come back up for any questions that anybody has. Thank you. Um, Brianna, why don't you come first? My name is Brianna Bissier, um, and I moved here with my family three years ago. My daughter, Sage, is eight. She was born in Yakima, Washington. Uh, we also lived outside of Buffalo, New York, in a little town called Tonawanda, and we lived in the Waterville area. And I have to say, just speaking from a parent's perspective, the children's <coughs> programming at Raymond Library is the best I've ever seen out of all four of those cities. Um, Karen is amazing, and what she does with, with 15 hours a week is just incredible. She is on a first name basis with all the children in Raymond, and she speaks toddler, so she's <laughs> she's incredible. Um, and the library is a real it's a real treasure to the community. And I know my daughter has some thoughts she'd like to share about the library. The library is great, and I really like how Karen always seems in those hours to come up with the best activities possible. <laughs> she always helps my brother Ian find the books he wants. He's Ian is four. <laughs> like, like my mom said, even when I, we can't <laughs> understand what my brother is saying, like one time he wanted a certain dump truck book and, and he was trying to say it, but we didn't know what he was saying. Karen <coughs> was able to tell us what he wanted, <laughs> and he got the book. <laughs> <laughs> 
and she knew exactly where it was. Yeah, she's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> My name is Jean LeBrecq, and I live in Raymond, and I am a proud cod carrying <laughs> member <laughs> of the Raymond Village Library. I hope you all are. For how long now, Will? <laughs> oh, God. Almost 40 years. I know who you are. <laughs> yeah, almost 40 years. I've been through a lot of library staff. Um, I just wanted to tell you, I'm at the library at least once a week. Um, I am a very avid reader. And I'd like to tell you what I see. And I will tell you, I think one of the areas we get our biggest bang for our buck in this town is the library and library programs. There is vitality and an energy in this library when you walk in. And it's, it's so much fun to see. I love seeing the children in the children's area. And this is not during the children's programming. It's when the parents bring their children in and they get so excited about books. Parents sometimes have arguments with their children about how many books <laughs> a child wants to take out. And if you have kept up with any kind of research on literacy and the importance of language and the richness of language development with children, it's scary. And to be able to have a program like the children's programming in the children's room is wonderful. Our collection at the Raymond Library, and I say our because it belongs to all of us, is wonderful. There are, for people like myself, the hottest place to be in the library is the new book cart. <laughs> and I'll tell you, there are people who look at that cart and pick up things with a big smile on their faces. We also have a very, very good large print collection. And there are a lot of older people who are very, very happy to have that large print collection available. One of my neighbors was one of those people, and not used it. <laughs> um, we have a great collection of, of DVDs. I've seen several patrons. Their interest in the library lies in the DVDs. They're not readers per se, but they really like the collection and what they borrow there. Young families come in to choose some DVDs for watching at home. When you want to talk about sharing and saving money, what a wonderful way to do it. Um, there are also audiobooks. I have another neighbor who uses, who borrows audiobooks frequently from the library. But these are reaching all different kinds of patrons, readers, visual learners, audio learners, um, into library loan through going through Allison and Connie, the two staff members who are usually, one of them is usually at the desk. I can borrow any book that I might like that's available through interlibrary loan any place in the state of Maine. It will come to the Raymond Library. They'll let me know it's here. I pick it up, I use it, and I return it to them. The volunteers, um, I consider volunteering in a very different way, I think, than Lee. I mean, I see when people bring in bags full of books to donate, they may not volunteer per se for an hour or two a week at the library, but there's a constant stream of materials that is being donated to the library. And the donations are used, if you've been to the library, you see there are carts and book racks of books and videos and, and, and DVDs that are for sale. There's a big library sale in June. I think sometimes if there's time and enough material left over, there's another one in August. I mean, these people, the volunteers and the staff work really hard at finding creative ways to, to earn extra money. They had a Christmas craft fair that if you were there, you were lucky if you weren't trampled to death. <laughs> <laughs> it was very, very popular. Um, the Christmas baskets are another big... Every item in a Christmas basket has been donated by somebody. Volunteers get together, they put theme baskets together that are for sale. They're delightful. The, the special programs, I just think, are what is bringing the vitality and the energy into the library. The program they had a week or two ago, the Hawk Henry, 
Um, there were two special programs for young children in the morning. There was a concert that night with him at the Raymond Village Church. The next morning there was a joint service with the minister at the Raymond Village Church. That was, that was brought to us by the Raymond Village Library, the Raymond Arts Alliance, and I mean, for young children it must have been marvelous. You know, it, it integrated nature and reading and music. I'm kind of running out of steam here, but I just <laughs> wanted to tell you what you would see. I am very, very proud to be a patron at the Raymond Public Library. And, and please, if you haven't stopped in, stop in sometime. I did manage to stop in one day to see the special program on Tuesdays for seniors. And that's absolutely delightful. You have people who may be playing Scrabble, other people may be sitting talking. There may be a few other people who are just sitting enjoying the atmosphere. Some people are looking for large print books. But I think that's a very, very special program. And as we tie into an age friendly, an aging friendly community, that's very, very important. Thank you for your time. I would appreciate your consideration of an increase of staff hours. <coughs> Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Sue Accardi. I live um, near Jean in Raymond, down on Deep Cove. Um, I, uh, I've been living in this town for over 30 plus years, and I have belonged to the library pretty much that long. Um, I, I'm here to, uh, to speak in support of the library and increase funding. I, you know, I've used different facility, you know, different things at the library. I usually get books out and whatnot. My kids were young, and we went and got books out. But in the last year or so, when I have a grandson who lives in Raymond, so I got to participate in Karen's um, children's program, and I just have to, I have to just, you know, say it's just amazing. And everything Brianna said and her daughter is um, exactly true. She really is an asset. She's she's real. She's a children's librarian. And I think that that speaks to all the staff in there. They're very professional. We have, lot, you know, certified librarians. And they, it's a very warm and welcoming environment. And all the special programs that are going on, really, it's just growing in that regard. So you can do so many different things there. And with the children's program, I did go to the Henry Hawks program and with my grandson, and it was, it was really, it was really awesome. It's so very different. I know they had been at RES the day before, and um, and they're going to be at the church. The uh, Karen has gotten uh, people in to do uh, some music programs over at the public safety building. Uh, she did a whole program on dinosaurs, and she brought in she brought in all her own stuff and set it all up on the floor, and uh, the kids really loved it. And um, now Saturday is going to be Dr. Seuss Day. And she'll be doing that. So I mean, it's just um, it's wonderful. And my son, my grandson loves going there. And it, and you know he's you know he likes the books, all right. But he really loves doing the stuff that she presents and playing. So I just um, I, I I do take out books a lot. And I did just recently get a, a book from the loan from some library up north that they got for me. Um, Connie and Allison are phenomenal, and Karen. And I really hope that um, you can see your way clear to um, support the increased funding for staff because I have a feeling I've been in there, you know, after four o'clock in the afternoon, and Karen is still there, you know. So I I know that she's putting in more than 15 hours already, but um, and, and so I'm hoping that she can be reimbursed for those extra hours as well. Thank you very much. So my name is Mary Therese Duffy, and I'm with the Raymond Arts Alliance. I live up in the Valley Road. And um, I understand that we are the third iteration of an arts organization, or a group of people struggling to be an arts organization in the town of Raymond. Um, I wasn't part of the first endeavor, but I do know that it couldn't be sustained. Um, I was part of the second, and I did observe that that couldn't be sustained. Um, so now I'm an active member of this third um, attempt, and I can clearly see that the difference between the RAA and um, everyone who tried to do this beforehand was quite simply support um, and resources. Um, as a program of the library, we've been able to use venues 
that have awakened curiosity in surrounding communities, whether it's the Hawthorne House or Hackers Hill. Um, we've been privileged to have our own page on the library website and create our own newsletter, um, allowing us to reach more people. Uh, our email list is up to 300 now. Um, if you've ever gone to our events, um, I credit my grandson. He's, he's nine, and he doesn't let anybody go by without putting <laughs> their email in there. And you can find him at aiden.fun.com. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, and just a piece on the impact of the arts on a community, the research is really, really clear. Um, they transform communities into destination towns. In fact, we had people come all the way from Portsmouth for the Hawk Henry's event. Um, so they stimulate and they contribute to the local economy. They provide safe, welcoming environments and experiences. And this is where people can transcend their differences and then they can come into some very unlikely friendships that they wouldn't expect to create and to enjoy, and they do. Um, they foster wider community partnerships, um, and so they create these really positive norms of social inclusion, while they're widening perspectives, they're nurturing attachment to one's own hometowns, so they increase civic engagement and volunteerism. They expand role models and mentors for our community's youth, Thus, they reduce their risk factors. Arts programming is a really amazing, special, and wonderful thing. And the Raymond Village Library recognized this in a heartbeat. And as our second expression was not making it, they approached us and said, come on with us. And they were right. Um, so the buzz we hear about us really bears out um, everything that uh, I've been saying. Um, just a sampling of the feedback we receive is you know, basically, thank you. Uh, we wouldn't hear this kind of music otherwise was in response to an international music night we had. Um, enlightening is a word we've heard. Uh, Raymond has needed something like this for a long time. And most recently, after four community organizations worked together to host Hawk Henry's, um, a, mo a young mother new to the community offered, I love what this community does. It's why I love living in Raymond. So the list of the Raymond Arts Alliance's programming, um, it's highly affordable, it's very high quality, um, and it's been quite extensive and diverse for the last year. I don't know if any of you have been tuned into what we've been doing, but we've been doing classes in um, the uh, AARP's number one recommended <coughs> form of exercise for seniors. Um, live music from across the globe in different cultures, poetry reading, comedy acts, and more. We had a 10-year-old magician up on this stage not too long ago. He was awesome. And none of this would be possible, none of it would be happening without the support, the commitment, and the advisement, really, of the Raven Village Library. The Arts Alliance is well aware of what an enormous treasure this little library has become to its residents, and I hope you recognize it, too. This is an amazing curiosity <coughs> and support in all its endeavors. Thanks for your time. <coughs> uh, I'm just going to, I created a list of some of the things, the programs that we do, and just to give you an idea of some of the things that, that we're doing. I, when I first saw this list last year, I was sort of blown away at some of the things, oh, sorry, <laughs> um, blown away at some of the things that we were doing that I didn't even know that the library was doing. Anyway, thank you for listening. Appreciate that, and I'm available for any questions. Let's see, what did I just do? Test. Okay, I'm ready. Thank you, Lee. Any questions for Lee? Yeah, please. Bad damn. Um, the uh, Raymond Arts Alliance, uh, <coughs> you know, is it affiliated with the library? It's a program of the library. Okay, now, what's their affiliation with the church? The church, it's it's sort of a, a three-way organization. Because you, you, organization. you know where I'm getting at with that. Uh, separation of church and there's no funding that happens okay. so it has to do with um, <clears throat> the the Raymond's Arts Alliance raises their own funds from people donating at the events okay. and then they use those funds to pay for you know artists etc now are they yeah. uh, required to pay rent at the church or fees no. or no no 
I mean, they've, they've given a donation to the church because from their funds that they've raised for the venue, but there's no fee for service. So there's a donation. Being there is made. a donation. Now, what happened to the old venue? What old venue? Oh, uh, the, the um, wasn't there one? They uh, were talking about, they're trying to use the Grange Hall that's at the bottom of Raymond the, Hill. Yeah, the old Raymond. It's yeah. not handicap access was one issue, and it did not have the heat source I think would have been too expensive for the Raymond Arts Alliance so to they would have had to pay to, rent or something. they would have had to pay rent and I don't and I believe my understanding at the time was they would have also had to have um, covered the cost of the, using the building so yeah. electricity and heat and that we would not at that time have been able not we because it wasn't me but have been able to create a self-sustaining program And we do some things at the library as well. At the yeah. library, at the Hawthorne House, Hackersville, we're always looking for other microphone. sites to do more programs to keep Oh, sorry. So the problem was that the, the Grange Hall was not insulated, so we, it was not um, possible to heat it in the winter, so we couldn't use any of uh, well, that as a facility. Well, I can't disagree with that, but that's my opinion. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, Last year, Lee, we talked about making the tax returns as, as part of your package. Is that correct? Do you remember that discussion? Uh, your tax, your 990s right. as part of the Right. Uh, okay. I thought I previously, yeah. I didn't realize that you had yeah. been getting them from the library. I thought you had gotten them off of the internet. No. So I was I not aware. I would not do that. Okay. Uh, last year, in your um, budget package, there were two years of tax returns. Okay. And this year you forwarded up your this, uh, June 18 tax return through the email channel. So that's where they source okay. for these tax returns. Have you filed an amended tax return in the last three years? No, not that I know of. Why did you change accountants this year? We, uh, because the person that I was working with before was not, uh, so what happened was, they came to me in the fall of 2017, a week before my tax returns were due, even though she had the file for two months. Who was they, Swanson or? or? It's Swanson. Okay. Mm -hmm. And had only just started to work on them, okay. even though they'd had them. And I was emailing them saying, do you have everything you need? Okay. And so I received those tax returns at about five o'clock on the day they were due. Okay. And I went back to her this spring and said, or you know, in the fall when I was going to give her my tax file, and I said, "Can I make sure that I get my tax files a while before, so that I can review them?" And she said, "Well, you better send me your file right away then." Okay. <laughs> so I was having an issue with that, and so I went to someone who I knew would give me the service that I needed. Okay. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. Just, that's a good. Yeah. That's a good reason to go. Um, your cash and investments in 2016 were 117,000. In 2017, there were 148,000, and in 218,000, and 205,000. Those numbers are straight off your tax return. Okay. Okay. Those are. I assume that those numbers. I are would correct. assume that they're correct as well. Okay. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Rolf. Yeah. <clears throat> Big concern I had, you know, you're, you're, you're adding services, but it doesn't appear to me that you're getting support, any additional support from the town people. Your your appeal has actually gone has gone flat and decreasing, and but yet we're taking, you know, we're, we're coming to the position where the town this year was at 56 percent of your budget. We're looking if if we stay the flat one at 60 percent, and if we go to the higher one, we're up at 62 percent. We're getting to the point where at what point does the town have the, you know, is the town running the library instead of the library running the library? Uh, if that is determined by the funding, I mean, if, if we do come here and listen to whatever comments we get from the select board and we try to act on those. So um, I, you know, I, we are continually looking for outside sources of income. We do things 
through grants, which we can't budget because we don't know when we'll get them or what the grant's going to be for. So um, you're right, on the pure budget, yes, it looks higher, but the overall income, if you look at the budget versus the actual income for the year, our income is higher than what our budget was. You're still projecting flat on the on what you're getting from the people in the town. Okay, your 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 annual appeal is actually been decreasing over the you know you're you're, you're looking at a 25k, and if I look at the historical there, you know you you know, actually you were higher in some pre prior years and it's been going down. And so that you know the the lead off was you know where do you want the library to be? Well, it would appear, if I look at it that, that the town doesn't care. <coughs> and if they do, why aren't they coming up? Why aren't they adding additional to it? I mean, uh, I, I, you know, yep. you, you, I, I know you put money into doing fundraising, you know, into uh, the people helping to run the fundraising and things <coughs> like that, uh, but it doesn't appear that you're seeing a return there. I see what you're saying. Okay, so when we first what was happening prior when you said that those budget numbers were higher was that the board was putting in wishful thinking budget numbers. So they were putting in $30,000 but only collecting twenty-five. So we went back after the library was in financial trouble and we went back and put in realistic numbers. So you're right, there was a reset. We wanted to make sure that we were going to hit the numbers that we projected. And we have been building them back up slowly since then. So our budget now, after the 25, was 30 this year, and we're actually at 33. So we are building it back up. It's slow, it's challenging, but we are working to pull more money from the community as well. Any other questions? Yes, please. Go ahead. Um, I, you know, Lee, I just want to thank you for what you're doing to the library. Thank You've you. helped them get their books straightened out. Uh, you did the same with Raymond Reck. Uh, you're doing a fantastic job. Thank you. I appreciate uh, it's that. been a long struggle. Uh, there's been a lot of issues with the library. I've heard them, I, but, you know, the library in my opinion, is one of the biggest assets we have in this town. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I will support it personally, financially, but you know, you're asking the taxpayers. Yeah. Uh, so it's a different story. Yeah. But you know, you, you guys are doing a great job now. It's, it's come a long ways, yeah. um, I have to say. I should also add, if you don't know, I don't know if this was in the um, write-up now because it's been a while, but um, none of our we our staff gets some vacation time if they're part you know full or part time um, at 27 hours and up or something like that, which is not most of our staff. Um, but there's no health benefits, so these flat fees of their salaries that's what they get. There's no other, because we, we couldn't afford it. <laughs> we know we couldn't afford it. So it's not like there's any benefit package that goes with all of this hard work. They get their paycheck and that is it. You know, plus the, the integration of the, uh, the garden space, uh, you're, you're adding new faces to the issue. Uh, you get people that are, you know, they like growing stuff, you know, so they'll go to the library. So, and they'll spend time there, so. And they'll spend hopefully their money, so and we'll, so for the, we'll, we'll yeah. see what happens. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, I'm also the coordinator of the community garden, so I I measure out the plots. Now, are the you a master gardener that, yet? Which is also all volunteer. What? Are you a master gardener? No, yet? but I've got two working. Come with on, me. let's go. I got go. two working with me. <laughs> um, but that's also a service. Our, it's a nominal fee. It's like fifteen dollars for one plot and thirty for two. It's just to cover real basics. But that way, people and if they can't afford to pay it, we will find a spot for them anyway. So that is really truly kind of a gift to the community members. All we need to do is sort of get seeds because we grow food for the food pantry as well. So that's just it's been really fun because as you're working there, people come to the library, they walk into the garden, we get to tell them what we're doing. So it's really it's a wonderful partnership with the library. And, and the it's a good way well. to introduce and, kids. And thanks to the town for letting us use that property that's on the other side of the parking lot. So.
in the interest of disclosure, um, I'm the president of the Raymond Village Library Board of Trustees. Um, so I won't be voting. Uh, I'll have to recuse myself on any actual votes on the budget. Um, but again, I will advocate in other discussions uh, and perhaps can answer even more questions um, as they come up. And I want to thank everybody that, that came tonight to show how special the library is, and particularly in its kind of new life and phase of community building. Thank you, Lee. I have two questions. Yeah. One is I noticed the garden tour, I think you guys are doing that like what, maybe every other year? Every other year. year, yes. Do you guys have something in place as another big fundraiser? For, On the for, off year? Yes. At the moment, no. Okay, because that's like $6,000 down from... Tour this year. Is it tour this year? It is this year. Yeah, so I was wondering that. Two is when... Oh, go ahead. No. Oh. No, I was going to say, and two is when, you know, you're talking about the employees as far as not getting benefits and stuff like that, and they're just getting the straight pay. When does the board, because um, I don't know what you guys discuss at your board meetings, but when does the board <coughs> say we should become a town entity? I mean, have you guys talked about it at a certain point? Do you guys think, okay, if you hit a certain percentage as far as what the town gets, you know, pros and cons, I guess, that you would list out, you know, from that? And I know last time that you guys mentioned about not becoming it is because you would lose grants on some aspects, but is there grants from joining the town that you can get? that you can't get standing alone. Yeah. So, so yeah. I'm looking at it from both sides. That's a great uh, conversation. I'm not sure, um, actually Sheila may be one to, <laughs> to talk to that about um, being, I, I'm not averse to being, having the library be a part of the town. I, I you know, if, if the board yeah. has the ability, I mean, we do a lot as a board yep. to support the library and the fundraising that goes on. Right. If you became a town department, you would then, I guess, create a Friends of the Library group that would then carry on that mission because I think, I think the library would need it. You're not going to yes. want to take the whole budget. So, and, and I think, I think I mean, maybe it would run similar, maybe to Tasseltop as well, far as. No, it wouldn't I, be Tasseltop. Uh, my understanding of the reason you have chosen not to do that is because you are a 501c3 and are. your contributions are tax deductible. That's exactly right. Which they would not be if you were a town entity. I believe. Okay. Okay. So that would probably so that was one funding. issue that you've had in the past. Yeah. Okay. The other, so there are other issues yeah, too. Yeah, the other issue is, and we have discussed this. Yeah. It's not an uncommon well, conversation at, on this at the board level. For years, yeah. um, but quite <coughs> honestly, I would say until about a year ago, I didn't think uh, the board discussion is financially. We had to peel back the onion, rebuild mm -hmm. from the ground up before we even felt that we could really engage in any type of other organizational model. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you're, as you see from our financials, we're getting things more straightened out. Another great reason that we switched accountants is this particular accountancy firm has more experience in fund accounting. We were with a, a company that w was really more around the profit sector, and you could see that reflected in our books. I think you're going to see continued maturity um, as we move forward, and um, I think that those discussions are on the table. I think it gets right back to what do we as a town want the library to be? Um, and realistically, town department could be on the table, or the other very tough discussion we have is maybe we can't expect the town to do that. So should we start cutting now and go back to, we're only open 30 hours a week, okay? Go back to pulling back, stopping the program, stopping the, the community outreach, if that's the direction the town wants. I mean, those are all conversations that would need to happen. Um, I think it would be hard for us to do that, I mean, from our hearts. Um, but again, the bottom line is money. It's always money. Um, and where does it come from? Uh, the continued outreach to the community is, is difficult at best. They're asked to support so many causes here in town. And um, I think, as, as Lee said, uh, we set actually a goal of 35000 this year, and we're at 33. So um, uh, we're doing better, and we want to keep working hard at it. Um, but again, it's, it's what do we want it to be? 
Well, can I follow up with that, with her on that? And I'm just asking, just because I think that there's probably pros and cons on either side is what it is, and figuring out what that is to make it keep going, keep it, you know, strong and stuff like that. But saying, okay, we've been carrying it for so long, we've done, but you have, you've had the last couple of years. I think the last two years is finally we see the numbers, the real numbers, compared to what we were getting before. And, and then you, you, I guess you got to look at it to say, okay, we have carried it so far. How can we make that big jump or whatever? Maybe that's not a big jump, you know? Okay, thanks. What's amazing, a lot of our people, particularly during the annual appeal time, assume we're a town department. A lot of people do. <laughs> There's yeah. a whole education process that we, we have to keep undertaking that, no, we're not a town department, yeah. though the town provides significant funding. Well, Dana. Marshall first. No, Dana. Go ahead, Dana. Okay, Dana. Uh, when we, my family and I, well, my wife and I first moved here, uh, we, uh, we, we went to the library and stuff, and uh, there was just a bunch of old ladies running the place, <laughs> right? And they were proud of that. We're the old ladies. They were the trustees. And they did a great job, fantastic job. And, you know, as we get older and stuff, we're all becoming older and stuff, but, you know, it, it, I mean, we're getting better with the library. It's, it's, it's come a long ways. Uh, there was a glitch, and that glitch, I think, has been fixed. So, uh, just, you got great programs. You always had great programs. Uh, my kids loved it, um, and hopefully, you know, someday my grandkids will love it, so. Marshall. Two questions, either Sheila or Lee. Um, do you know how much of the annual appeal is it really 501c3, and how many people take that as deductions, and is it worth continuing to carry the 501c3? I think things are changing because the tax environment just this recently dramatically right. right. changed. Right. Um, uh, I think we're going to have an additional challenge next year mm -hmm. um, that your donation is tax deductible will save us a whole line on our thank you notes, but... Um, well, they may not be. <laughs> yeah. It's always I mean, said it may be tax deductible. May be tax deductible, <laughs> yeah. I think it's going to be increasingly difficult because particularly, and again, for us, a large donor is like $500, okay? Um, was. With some exceptions, our, our uh, renovation was a very generous gift, but I think it's going to continue to get harder, Marshall. Okay, the second question I have is, can we make it, and I, don't, I didn't want you to think I was coming in the back door with your tax returns. I wasn't because okay. they were on the table already. Yeah. Um, can we make it? Your a part policy of it. to make two years tax returns part of your two years. Tax. Okay, sure. Signed two years. Thank you. Well, I'd like to bring up the signature thing. We don't sign them anymore. Well, we you signed the last two. We had to come Sheila. in. Sheila. Yeah, we had to come in. You signed the last two. Yeah. You got to sign something. Switch firms. It's all electronic. Yeah, it's electronic. Signature now. As a as a banker, long time banker, documents like this on white paper mean nothing to me. I like to see something letterhead. I like to see a wet signature, as they call it. Something to acknowledge ownership. I'm just teasing you, Marshall. I know you. Are. I know you are. <laughs> but that's where I'm coming from, trying to make it. We Somebody has ownership of this document right yes. now. It's just paper. Right. Yeah, right. Just one, one thought is I think <laughs> if, if we want to get into a discussion about the library becoming a town entity, Hope we will go through that discussion of for what end, for what purpose, what's the goal or objective? Is it money savings? Is it to do something that the, the library is currently not doing? It, um, you know, what 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 is the value that the that the town gets by it becoming a government entity? My personal concern would be that it would actually be a I lot more expensive, mm -hmm. and um, no. so. I mean, if there's something if there's something that's lacking, then I think it's, I think it's a great discussion to have. Um, and my, so. discussion. Well, yeah. I think one of my big concerns is is it comes down again to volunteers and 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 boards and and you know how it is. I mean, we just recently got our planning not our planning board and our zoning board of appeals boards full, but every group is is hurting. Yeah. And what happens is when 
you've got people that get burned out. Lee, Lee's got what, four or five hats? I mean, that she's just mentioned here tonight, and thank you for that, seriously. I don't mean to point in front of you either. Um, and, but you get to a point that you get burned out, and then what happens is literally what the people that have been carrying it for this long now, guess what? They wanna go enjoy sitting in the library and relaxing and, and taking their grandkids and stuff like that, but where's, where's the new people coming in to help, and are they gonna carry it? That's my concern, so what happens is the ball gets dropped. The library really starts fading, they start losing the programs. That is a big concern of mine because you see it in boosters, you see it Raymond Rec, you see it in ski programs, you see it in everything that you do. Look, look at, I, I'm sitting here thinking about the fire department, trying to get staff in for that. That is a big worry of mine is we are not gonna get, because there is no such thing as really a volunteer. And technically, look at all of us, the people on the board. I mean, I called I call some of you guys and say, hey, you know, come on, we need board members. Look at Perry over there, like, yeah, don't call me again, he says. Um, but it is, it's getting, it's getting people to get out and get involved. And, and people can complain about things, but get them to step up and, and stand behind it. And that is a really big worry I have that people are going to get burned out. And they're not going to have that enthusiasm in that. So that's my worry. Tracy never called me, Tracy. For what? Board? For volunteering? I'm, <laughs> I'm off. I'm done with this. If you could, please, Greg, <laughs> the microphone. Um, Paul Cullinan, I'm the vice president of the Raymond Library Board. Um, the vi dependence on volunteers is a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. um, we've overwhelmed, as far as I can tell, I've been in this community 10 years, and all of the same people do the volunteering. Yes. And they are overloaded, and they're starting to age out. Yes. Where, you know, it's much more difficult for them to do this. And I think what you'd find is if the town took over the whole organization here, volunteerism would disappear from the library to a large extent. It's giving I them an out. It, it, I'm paying for it through my taxes. Um, you know, why should I help out here? You know, it's the town's right. responsibility. So I think there's a, it's a, I it goes both ways on, on those sorts of things. And I just want to correct one thing. The... Um, Garden tour, tour netted about in the between 4,000 and 4,500. The total receipts from it was the $6,000 figure there. Didn't, that did not include the expenses for that. So. And, and thank you for giving that other side of that. But you see, yeah, there, there's there's pros and cons of the whole thing. Exactly. So. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Rolf? Yeah. I, yeah. I'm not advocating that the town take it over. Yeah, my my whole that. point is that you're getting less and less direct support from people and you're getting you know, more and more is coming more and more is coming through through the town through the through the tax line, shall we say. Because I mean obviously mm -hmm. if it if it goes in the municipal budget as there it's it's a tax it. So you know the concern is that at what you know it's always been a concern that people think it's a town, but sure. it, you know the, the town government has the library, and they don't. They're not recognizing it is a private institution. Mm -hmm. The town is helping to support it as well as as well it should. There's a lot of good things that come out of there, and you know there's been a lot of big improvements. But what I, where my concern is is I'm not seeing the buy-in from the population too, and that's. That's a concern. As we get further down the line, when you start to run short on volunteers, when you start to run that, and you're not having the financial support for in the in the annual appeal and things like that, that's that's a concern area. Yeah. Uh, we would would agree with that. That the um, we've done much better this year with the annual appeal. We hope to continue that success. But um, you know, if those things. We're in a fairly good economic period right now. And, you know, if we come back into a, a recession, those contributions will diminish for a bunch of those people, particularly some of the large ones might become smaller. So we will continue to work and have our outreach to try to maximize what we can get through, through contributions and donations, for, not just through the annual appeal, but for other support, for instance, this past year. Um, 
we got a, a shed donated for the uh, community library. And we got uh, Sheds Are Us to mm -hmm. set it in place for, for free. So we, we keep on looking out for those things that we can try to improve the facilities, improve the programs, improve that. But we do keep conscious that we need to come up with the money for this. And we appreciate the support of the town. Any other questions? Thank you, library people. I'll give you a few minutes to leave if you like. Next up will be code enforcement. All right, next stop, again out of order, but considering he's got a long drive home, Scott, let's do a code enforcement right now. Just offer him a tic-tac to keep him away. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, 13, page 13 and, and the substantiation is on page 40. Budget. There really isn't much of a change. There's a slight uh, increase in our phone. Uh, we decreased the training. Um, I don't need as much as prior to, so we decided to knock that back a little bit. But other than that, um, pretty much it stayed the same across the board. And do you have any questions for me on that? Any questions? Yeah. Scott, on the um, <coughs> excuse me, on the software, is that an annual license that you're paying, or is that also as a maintenance, and um, or does it also it, include your equipment? It doesn't include any equipment. It's more of a license. Um, it is a a um, building permit, which we're trying to work through. Some we're getting some training next week um, to be able to. I could act. What well, we're having an issue is me being to get into it and use it. Um, Right now, we're slowly getting into that, and uh, I'm a little technically challenged at times, so it's not exactly the easiest thing for me to get used to, but I'm getting there. Got it. And is it, um, um, do we pay a license on a per seat basis? Is it just, do we have one seat, meaning you, just you, or? It's uh, my admin and I. Okay. Great. Thank you. <coughs> This is the easiest budget to read. You realize that? Yes, it's like it is. One, one page, one plaque. <laughs> works, <laughs> works for me. <laughs> Go ahead, Ralph. Uh, looking at on the revenue side, you you know you get projected in there 85 k for this year. Uh, that looked realistic. I mean, it looked like it looks like it was your actuals for this year were a little bit higher. So is that is you looking at downs or are you looking at that? Forgive me, I'm not conservative. I'm um, usually, I was the one that did it, so you can't really blame Scott for it. <laughs> 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 I was there like, what are you talking actually, about? Actually, they've had a, quite a, uh, a good run this year so far, so yeah. I think they'll exceed. But, yeah, but I, I, my concern is in the, in the next budget, what are you seeing there? Are you seeing that, you know, because it really comes in uh, in two fronts. Number one, are, you know, are we, do we have an issue downstream on headcount? And number two, uh, you know, are, is, is the growth looking like it's going to be good for the town? Um, it's actually probably compared to the last year. I'm probably a, a little bit busier than I was last year with people coming in on shorefront. Um, just to <coughs> what they want to do this um, this spring and summer. We actually, actually had some uh, interest in commercial. And... Um, 
actually there's a quite a there's a few more beyond shoreland zoning as far as houses that are coming in so i'd say all in all it's either it's got it's a little bit if it keeps going this way it'll be a little bit better this year as far as permits mm -hmm. than than last year that's the optimistic projection <laughs> which, from kathy the did. <laughs> which kathy did <laughs> Do we have any other questions for Scott? Short and sweet. Drive safely. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up, we're going to take public safety. We want to look at page 17. Fire Rescue Chief Tanner Raymond, uh, resident of Valley Road. Um, thank you. Um, I see a few new faces here tonight. I'd like to welcome everybody who wants to, new faces or people who have been around, to come down to the fire station, stop in and say hello and look at the equipment, the buildings, etc., and ask any questions that you might have. We found that works very well in the past for people to get an education, so you're welcome to that. Um, and as the board chair said, we are looking for members constantly, so if anybody's interested. Please come down. Um, our budget this year, we've changed a few things around in it. Um, there is one line that has an increase in payroll and salaries, and that's an item that's going to the select board next Tuesday. Um, and it's just a placeholder, basically, for that. Yeah, it'll be the union contract negotiations. Other than that, what we did do is we uh, realigned some things that needed to be realigned, and we continually do that as we find things shift and needs shift. So we'll move money from uh, one place or we'll reduce money in an account as, as necessary. One of the things that we have found is that uh, our building maintenance costs are down. We've had uh, some monies put aside over the past few years. We've put a new metal roof in. We've added insulation into our ceilings, re-sheetrocked those ceilings above the suspended ceilings. Uh, that saved in heat. Uh, also in our maintenance, we don't leak anymore because of the metal roofing. <laughs> Nicely uh, done. And we've uh, replaced a lot of our flooring, which now doesn't require waxing and stripping constantly. We've gone through and painted most of the upstairs of the building, things like that. So we found that reduction is very viable for us. Over the years, you've seen reductions in our heating costs and electrical costs. Again, because of the efforts that we've undertaken with grants to get LED lighting uh, and such and re-insulating. We changed our heating plant out at the central station before the station was 12 years old. It was a necessity, and uh, that saved us considerable on the propane. Um, other than that, supplies and operations changed a little bit this year, and we had a reduction there, and um, we're just seeing that we, we need a few less things. And we've realigned a couple of the other accounts. We've added a little bit more to radios, I believe it was, and some into the turnout equipment or turnout gear account which unfortunately is uncontrollable to us. Uh, repairs have gone through the roof and new gear is costing more and more every year. So there's not a whole lot I can do about that. We still have to outfit our firefighters and rescue members. Other than that, it's pretty straightforward, I believe, and uh, would welcome any questions that you may have. Bob, Dana, go ahead. Um, uh, do you have any uh, new equipment coming in this year, uh, Brooks? Yes, uh, I, I should mention that too, that we just got the tanker put in service. That was done on the grant from about a year and a half ago. So that was uh, put in service. The new ambulance should be here in April-ish, we expect delivery Now how old was the other ambulance? Uh, the rescue it's replacing is 10 or 11, 10 years old now. Is that correct, Scott? Well, you have the figures on it. So that's a 12, okay, so. Well, not not quite, not quite. But it's got a, 
over so what, what are you doing? Five so, years, six years? We or? were in a plan that was a regional grant, a regional approach rather, not a grant, but a regional approach with five other towns where we had a deal with a vendor. Yeah. And that whole deal fell through. We had a guaranteed purchase price, a guaranteed trade-in if we kept our mileage at a certain point yeah. and it had a, met a certain condition. Yeah. Unfortunately, that deal fell apart and everybody's pulled out of that deal. So. Um, these ambulances we found to be hard to maintain. They were cheaply built, hence the good deal that we got. So as we move forward, we found that we need to replace them, and we're on a five-year, six-year replacement, and the six-year plan with Braun Ambulance will re-chassis the ambulance. So the box will stay and remain. It will get repainted and fixed and set on a new chassis when it has approximately 100,000 miles on it. Now, did that deal fail because of the other towns in that bailed out, or is, you know? They all bailed out, but the real failure was in the company that was the manufacturer and the warranty work, because we weren't getting them to stand behind it. For example, the truck we're <coughs> replacing right now needs repainting again. The paint's blistering right off from it. It's been done already. It's already at, been repainted. At no cost, I hope. At the first time was at no cost, but not without a battle, and it was a battle. The second time around, they wanted to pay only a quarter of the cost or less, and the battle would have been probably insurmountable and not effective on our behalf to win it because their warranty was pretty clearly written. They were going by the original purchase date, and that's what it was. So this is why everybody pulled out of it. It just wasn't a viable deal anymore. It cost well, it more sucked. in the end. I mean, yeah, correct. Good words. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. Right. So that's that's basically it and where we stand on it. It just wasn't a viable deal for the town of Raymond. It wasn't a good deal. So the town of Gray and us, um, Wyndham is buying these ambulances now. Portland has gone all brawn ambulances, which is what we used to have, probably should have stayed with. Yep. Uh, they were a very good unit, well built. Warranty is incredible. The service is incredible. Uh, their company's out of Frenchville and they I know travel about and them. know them well. Yeah. <laughs> They do great work. So. Yes. Anyway, that's great. the reason why in a nutshell. Yeah. Okay. Thank Teresa. you. Two questions. Yes. One, why is the Marine, and sorry if you've already covered this, why is the Marine Unit, Marine, oh my gosh, Marine Unit more expensive to paint this year? It's in your cover letter on page 46. Oh, oh, I wasn't ready for CFP, but, so. Oh, it, is it? I can. Okay, no, I can, I can wait. wait. Yeah, no, thank yeah. you for that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm looking at all the stuff together as sort of was for fire rescue. Thank you. Well, CIP's their bonus, I can answer. Uh, okay. Teresa. You know, they, that comes another night. No, no you can do your CIP. It's not Christmas if you want to. Sure, why not? CIP's in the All right, so I look for what, do, what do you want to do? Let's hold off CIP. Let me ask my question. Is it about CIP? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, jeez. <laughs> When's CIP? Right here. Too much. Right now, well, he said no. He said to wait. No, no CIP, CIP is, is with the department in which it yeah. pertains. Like, you do okay. yours with you. And and public works. Nathan's going to do his with him. I, I, I guess what I was looking at is the letter that Bruce wrote, okay. 46. And then I look at page 45, which is still fire. That's why I'm looking at all of this stuff together. Mm -hmm. No, I will wait. Gosh forbid, no, yes, no. I, I will hold that question until it's not, the next meeting. There is there is no wait. Okay. No, Ms. Ricker has Let's do it now. changed the program slightly. And so no, we changed it like two years ago. Yeah. Ms. Ricker changed the program <laughs> like two years ago. It's all included. And so, okay. Oh my so God. The, so the CIP should be discussed with the department. Right Sorry. Okay. Get Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I have the next agenda. Oh, okay. There is no CIP yeah. on it. Okay. 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 The next Sorry, day. I didn't so, no, I'm just looking at all the fire rescue together and it's just two questions. One is, is okay. the Marine Union. Marine, Marine Union. I said it again. Marine, Marine Unit. unit. <laughs> How it's much a tongue twister. Yes. Um, Why is it higher? The Marine <laughs> Unit would, would be higher. We, we originally appropriated right monies on. for that several years ago. We have been trying diligently ever since to get some people to take our boat oh, and give us a deal and, and paint it. Uh, uh, Hopefully at a partially donated cost, we approach Saber. They won't touch paint. They'll do gel coat. This is an aluminum boat, so they won't. Um, we've looked at several other vendors. We had one that was interested and would have done it, but our boat will not fit in his shop. Oh. How, Height you know how or length wise. So we had to go back to the drawing board and 
everybody else is much, much higher and I guess not so willing to give us a deal. Plus it's been, I think, I have to ask Bob on this one, but three or four years that we actually, because Bob's part of our Marine unit. Uh, it's been at least that. At least that, okay. Who's, who's actually doing it then? So we're, we're, we're looking at two vendors right now and one of them is uh, Portland Yacht Club. And it will involve us doing a whole lot of the work ahead of time in order for them to do it at the price we have budgeted. Um, what was the other one? What's the price you have budgeted? I'm sorry. And so you have that right in front of you. Yeah. 22,000. The last quote we got from Portland Yacht Services to strip it for them to do everything was 25,500. So we had 7,500 budgeted. So in places, our orange oh, boat. Wow is now pink because it's so bleached by the sun. Pink there's nothing good. wrong, yeah, there's nothing wrong with the pink, pink boat. boat. <laughs> pink in places and not in others is yes. that. Yes. Go um, ahead, Don. It, okay. Just to, it's, it's a lot of money to paint the boat. The reason is it's a lot of boat. You're talking about a 27-foot boat, you know, that's um, a you know, fast rib uh, boat, Coast Guard boat. We paid $14,000 order magnitude for it. It was upon its original purchase, you know, a $250,000, $280,000 boat. It's a $400,000 boat today. So it's a lot of money, but it's a lot of boat. So you're maintaining an asset that Correct. has a useful life of, you know, I don't know how many years, but it was a 2002, and we got it in 2006 for $14,000. On that Portland Yacht Services, we did take it in. They did an inspection on it. I've got like an eight-page report from the guy. He said the boat is in excellent shape. You know, the painting is what needs to be done. or stripping it for that. Um, and he said we should have many, many years out of this boat. So it is definitely worth doing. So we've had a couple of different vendors. A lot of them just don't want to touch a boat with that type of work. That's part of the issue. The second question I had is, excuse my ignorance on this, is the simulcast radio system. What it All right. Oh, so yes. Exactly so a few years back, we put up a new radio tower, as everybody, or most everybody recalls. Right. Um, it did take care of about 90% of our issues, but we created, as you do with RF, which is a fickle being, if you will, another issue. Um, most times, they'll tell you you will spend your first uh, half of your money creating or fixing the first issue, and then you'll spend another half of that to fix the other issues you've created. Unfortunately, it's just the way it is. So we have a shadowed area that's right by our station. So we have a problem talking in and talking out of our radio system on the 302 corridor between 85 and Cape Road, partially down on Cape Road near the Mains residence and where Cliff Small is. So that's our dead spots that we have. Um, from a truck, we can talk. From a portable radio, you cannot. So operations in the field are hampered by that. The simulcaster system is a rebroadcasting system, and I'm trying, to, I, I'm trying to explain it so everybody can understand it. So at the same time as our main tower broadcast, there is a split second delay causing the radio traffic to go out at the same time at both locations and back in at the same time at both locations. And there's a built-in delay mechanism in it. I'm confusing everybody. <laughs> See, I'm not so pass the what it later does later. do <laughs> is it allows that dead spot to go away. Okay. And it fixes that. And it would be a, a piece of equipment that would likely go at the elementary school. We have one piece of equipment there now, and this piece of equipment would also accompany that and, and fix that. It looks right down over our dead spot, which is great. So if that's a uh, dead spot, why are you not doing all of it then to fix it now? Yep, yeah, that would be the one that, that will fix it all. Okay. Yep, yeah, that will fix it all. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Dana. Um, Two questions, Bruce. Yes. Um, would the replacement of the antenna at Town Hall solve that problem? No. And why is that? The reason because is... Because we've had um, antennas there forever. Yeah, we, we did. What we had when we used the Town Hall as a broadcast center. If yes. That, that was our main Yeah, it was dispatch. Right. Yeah. So when we used that, we had shadows on both ends of town. So okay. we had the Cape Road area, we had the north end of town. Down by you was a bad spot. Yeah. Uh, down by uh, the old Christ Chapel and stuff on the lake. Yeah. Very bad areas. Couldn't talk at all. Yeah. So when we moved our tower up there, the propagation study said that that would be a good location. So we moved it up on the Valley Road. We're 700 feet of base elevation with a 100-foot tower. 
the problem is, is Raymond Hill still creates that little bit of a shadow coming down the back side of it. Yep. So it, and radio does not penetrate ground. So it oh. doesn't contour and go over it. It's straight out. So a hill I understand will block that. it. It won't work. Um, so yeah, so that tower wouldn't wouldn't work there. Now and my second so question uh, isn't county uh, helping us with the uh, uh, expenses on the uh, on the boat? Yes, fuel. They do. They pay for fuel. And they pay they for saying? winterization and opening the boat up, if you will, getting it ready. Now, for the is any of their personnel using that boat? They run ten shifts on the lake every year. That they fund, yeah. and, and that normally, yeah, and, and so they fund in an it. emergency. So they are funding those those positions. So there's a mutual agreement. Yes, yes there is. That's and all I want It's working very well. It's well, it, if it's working, that's great, because I I I totally appreciate help from the county. Absolutely. Yeah. Good, Doug. One of the leading complaints that I got when I first came here was from the folks on Big Sebago, who summer people mostly but some year round people who said, you know, we get very little for our taxes, and one of the big concerns is that, um, you know, the, the boating traffic is, uh, is very um, heavy and at times, you know, reckless operations, operating under the influence, these sorts of things. So the county has these 10 shifts that are out there on the key summer weekends, and of course the county being out there has caused the IFNW to, to step up their game. Yes. So now what we have is a situation where we have, you know, significant patrol presence on the lake on those key weekends, which has completely eliminated the complaints that I get from the folks on Sebago, which is a nice thing. And I've had a number of people tell me, you know, property taxpayers, large property taxpayers, that they feel like um, that that's a, a worthy service and that alone's worth the, the price of admission for the taxes uh, because they had such a problem out there. Mm -hmm. What's the condition of the other boat, Bruce? The other boat's in good shape. That's the uh, Boston Whaler. It's a 19-footer, and we did the paint job on that in-house because uh, it's such a small boat. We could do it. Mm -hmm. You could and, flip it uh, over. It's not the best job, but it, it is a roller job, but it, it worked. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, that boat's in good shape. Yeah. Good. Nobody else does. Bruce, on page 8, on line 3230, it says travel and, and training. And in 2018, uh, it was budgeted $14,000. Actual, you spent about half of that. Um, the 19 budget is $14,000, but uh, this year and this year's budget is a $3,500 increase in that. Can yes, you correct. that increase to us? Yeah, as we discussed uh, in last year's budgets, we needed to start paying our people for training. And what we hadn't been doing is paying for the classes and for the people to go through their initial training. Uh, so fire one, two, uh, their BLS classes, their EMT classes, and such. Right now, we're very fortunate that we have five new people coming on board, and they're all in these classes. So the initial outlay will be 15, 25, about 3,200 for those people right out the gate, just in their training. Okay. So that's, that's the reason why we've increased that. We're hoping to get more people on board, and we do understand that we've got to pay, unfortunately, the fees to get them trained. So. Well, it's only right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Sheila? Yeah, I just have one question. I know there's a discussion about the union uh, contract coming up in a select board meeting, but with what you've laid out in salaries, um, is this going to get us to the point where we can fill vacancies, where we can do what we need to do in terms of staffing. <clears throat> the monies that we put into that line as that placeholder are based upon the contract proposal and what that would bring to us. Yes, that would bring that wage adjustment up, which I can't disclose yet. So we we would, Raymond would be in a better position? <clears throat> yes. So we're not going to lose somebody position. for 50 cents an hour type stuff? Well, or, we, uh, the goal... Yeah, it's still tough is to get us to a close average of the area. And I think I could say that safely. Um, it's an executive yeah. session matter. Yeah, so and so I can't go any further now. into yeah, detail. Yeah, I understand. I'm just saying, are we going to yeah. get there? So we'll see. Yeah. I, I think we'll see. Done. If you were watching the news the other evening, this is a huge problem, <coughs> you know, statewide, countrywide. I don't think anyone can give an affirmative answer to that question. 
with the shortage of people who have the you know the the credential that we're looking for. So it's a it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, it's a competition, Don, with uh, towns and municipalities that right. uh, want to uh, lure, <coughs> you know, people who want to work. So, you know, it's just... Yep. It's great you have five new people, though. That's the <coughs> Brian? Yeah. Chief, a uh, question about how you go around, how you go about um, acquiring things. So, for example, on a major capital expenditure like the simulcast, does that go to bid? Um, yes, in general, yes, that stuff will all go out to bid. Um, I don't know as we're going to, I, I think what we'll do on this one is I'm going to pull a comparative cost from a different vendor. And the reason why I say that is the vendor we've been using is offered the equipment at their cost plus labor. If I can verify that with other companies, then I don't know what process we need to go into and I would need to talk with the manager and the select board about that. What's in it for those guys? Uh, servicing then, or what? Why would someone offer you something at cost? Yeah, that would be basically. Yeah, it's a company I've worked with forever and a day. Okay. Um, they've always treated us very, very well. Okay. Um, and this is always very dangerous. So I, I want to yes. be very respectful as I say this. I went online to find out about well, how how expensive would it be for me to buy a turnout yep. coat and pants and. Does the name Veri Viridian Velocity Nomex, does that mean anything to you guys? Yep. Is that a good, fairly good company? Yeah. Okay. Because we've, that was we've looked at and done a lot of research um, on our turnout gear um, over the years. So there's certain needs that we, we have. Um, one, we have a reflective package that we improve because we deal with Route 302 and a lot of the small towns don't have so you're augmenting habits. what would be so the stock so we augment a lot of that yeah we have some things like built-in harnesses if you will and that allows us to have a piece of rope to bail out of the second floor should we need to go quick yeah. uh, there's no stairs involved at that point uh, we have to have tool places for rescue self-rescue tools and stuff so we do modify our, our gear packages okay. I, this we'll is not say a place extreme, to be, but we do a Yeah, this is not a place to be to go cheap, and I'm not right, suggesting right. that. I'm just curious yeah. about, because I, I saw $2,200 What's that? All those models are less than 40 bucks a set. Yeah, all the models, yeah, okay. All our modifications were less than $40 okay. a set, you're right, yeah. right. Scott I just was didn't involved. know if it was like, do you always go to the same distributor to get all your stuff? Not or always. Or your shopping? We, we just recently switched from... Uh, Bristol Gear, which was manufactured in Kentucky, and it's an English company. Mm -hmm. uh, but we just switched to Globe, which is manufactured and owned right here in, in uh, New Hampshire. Okay. It's like an hour and a half from here. It's in Epsom, New Hampshire. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Thank you, Chief. And Deputy Chief. I guess I'm going to take things in order from here on. Uh, this this Duke County tax on page 30. Um, I'm very pleased to represent yeah, sure the county. <laughs> I'm sure you are. Um, so the final final county tax levy is seven hundred eighty-eight thousand three hundred sixty-eight dollars, an increase of forty-six thousand four eighty-seven. I think I I read somewhere from the county that. You know, our, our rate of valuation growth exceeded by some measure the average, and so that's what, what that's about. So it's, I think somebody used the term two-edged sword. I mean, the fact that we have a growing and, you know, financially stable, prosperous town is a good thing. When it comes to county taxes, that is a, a thing that factors into the, uh, into the equation. And uh, so that's where, that's where the county tax is at, though. So can you give us that number again, please? 788,368, an increase of 46 now, now, doesn't that increase happen every year, Don? Uh, an increase happens every year, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> okay. data, but, but not, not. That's a. I, I think we have tended to track more with the average. We're above the average this year, and so that's that's exceptional because Cumberland County is the growth county, along with York of the yes. state of Maine, and so that says we're on a valuation growth basis doing better than the average. 
and we're in a pretty strong group of towns. Now, does that give us a signal that maybe we should be doing a reval at some point, uh, <coughs> town-wide? Funny you should mention. Is that Funny. next week? Is that yeah, uh, that's a that's, that's a discussion, a discussion topic. All right. Is that going to be an executive session or? Uh, no. Oh no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Ralph. Uh, was the county aware that we had a budget meeting tonight? No. You could certainly have the county come and present next time. Just my question, my the follow-up, the, if they were, why isn't somebody here, number one? Number two, I mean, you know, ours, you know, based on their new numbers, our value has gone up uh, six, and, oh, six and a quarter percent. But absent that, uh, they went up five percent. <coughs> I mean, when everybody else is trying to, when everyone else is trying to toe the line and keep things normal, they just willy-nilly, drunken sailor, go out and spend. And, you know, the last time they were here, they were very unresponsive. And so I, didn't, I don't expect they'd be a whole lot more responsive this time around. But the fact is, you know, they're getting, you know, close to $800,000 from us. They ought to have somebody here to justify it. Well, we did not make that specific request. I believe that there's only been, in my time here, I think there's only been one year that they came, and they came under a special invitation, which you certainly could make, and you have another budget meeting. Mm -hmm. You could have them up front of that other budget meeting if you wanted to. But we, we did not specifically invite them. And they didn't specifically reach out and ask about it. So so that may be our fault, their fault, you, you decide. But, but I don't believe they've historically come come to the meeting, but that certainly could change. Well, I mean, you've got some of this, you know, that's taking, you know, $788,000 yeah, in the town. And I get it. what are they giving us in services? We're certainly not getting $788,000 in value out of it. <coughs> I would agree with that, but I would tell you that you're probably getting 500000 with the Sheriff's Department. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Sheriff's Department is a good service, and it replaces the Police Department, and you couldn't do a Police Department for 500000 in a small town like this. That's what you're getting, though, in my mind, is the, is the Sheriff's Department. You get the jail. Take it from the Sheriff's Department. But that may not, that may not add to 788. I, I, don't other, I mean, there are other things. They're small, relatively. But, I mean, if anybody's filing a, I know. a claim or a quit claim or any of those things, that all has to do to the county. That's, that is true. But, so but, as small, a percent of, but, but as a percent of the budget, it's a small, totally agree. A small yeah. piece. And then I guess... I mean, controversially, the thing that you get is the Civic Center and its debt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, if, if you want them, well, we could certainly reach out to them and, and have them attend. Oh, yeah, a, what I what I think was interesting uh, last time, is, last time you asked you asked the elected representative to come, and she came, but she came with the county manager. But, do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. And he was on his way out the door too. The sheriff was here. Sure. Okay, but I don't know if the sheriff spoke, did he? Yeah, yeah. he can okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, but I, I, but I think the issue really was not to hear the sheriff or the county manager. You wanted, I think the idea was you wanted to hear from the elected representative. Yeah. Is that correct? It was, because at the end of the day, it was what was she doing to help toe the line on keeping things, in, keeping, keeping the budget normalized. I mean, she's, you know, if they're taking, you know, the input from the sheriff and the input here and here, they say, okay, fine, you know, well, you know, or if they're listening, if their main listening points are Portland, and the rest of it is, you know, you pay what you pay based on your valuation. You know, I mean, it's time for them to look at either pricing by head or whatever, and let the people that are using the services pay for the services. Rolf, that's why I voted no every year on the <laughs> county budget. Me and Mike Reynolds. <laughs> yeah, the, well, the unfortunate point is. We can't. We can't not. We well, can't wanna, not do you wanna, well, you can't say no to it. Yeah. And we can't even make a reduction to it. Yeah. We can't make a recommendation to it. So the problem is the representative that you know represents us. Yeah. It's not the county. It's the people that represent us. So, so that brings me back to what do you want to do? Do you want to extend that invitation specifically? to our representatives, Sue Watonis. Do you want to see Jim Gailey? Do you want to see Kevin Joyce? Do you want to see all the above? What, what do you want to do? And what's the pleasure of the committee? Why would you see Kevin Joyce? Well, she brings her dog and pony show, that's yeah. why. Yeah. Yeah, I just, 
I just don't see that it would be a productive use of our time. I don't see no, so either. either. No. You know. Other than just yeah. wasting their time. Right. Yeah. I think Rolf needed to blow off this steam and make it <laughs> a public <laughs> record. I don't, I don't blame him. <laughs> but I wonder if there's a, something we could do in terms of at least putting together or creating some type of document, a written document that goes to our elected official to say of our displeasure um, from the select board and the, or the joint select board and budget finance to say, because if we say nothing, then they go, gee, I guess a 6.27% increase really didn't ruffle Raymond's feathers, and they're the ones who usually have their feathers ruffled. I think we send the wrong message. So it might be something we should do just in a written and, and copy the appropriate people on it and make sure that the paper gets it as well. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. I think it that's can be done, and at least it puts us on the record. I mean, I, I, I agree with Sheila. I don't think bringing them here is. No, I mean, with the exception of, of frustrating everybody, I don't think that's going to have much value. But. Yeah, the only problem, I, I, I think we can certainly do that. The only thing that that doesn't do, though, is it doesn't give them an opportunity to address to your concerns before you blast them. That's a fair point. That's the only problem with that's it. That's a really good point. It looks like it's a kind of like a cheap shot. Yeah, I get you. But I agree with Sheila. I mean, you're not going to, it's not going to make a difference, probably, but. We'll let them respond to the letter. No, I, I, I still think the letter is the best thing to do. We could ask for like a, just a little synopsis of what they felt the main drivers were for the increase. The increase. The budget increase this year. I mean, part of our increase was based on the valuation, and part of it was just an overall increase in the county's budget. So I, I think we could probably get some verbiage out of them at least for that, and then I can send it out, and then you guys can decide what you... Then you could decide to send if, a letter. If you still want it, or if you change your mind and you want them to come. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good strategy. You know, let's get some facts response and then make a decision yeah. where to go next. I, I, I don't think the level of increase, though, if you look back, is, Brian, is... It's not a good thing, but I don't know if it's inconsistent with the history. No, it's uh, well. It, I think uh, as maybe well, a little, so I'm but not. It up. I think it's four point seven seven is the break, was what I had in my head. Four point nine nine was their their increase right. in the county right. tax. We got a bigger hit of it because. Right, but I'm saying the four point nine nine to me doesn't strike me as an inconsistent number from their history. I thought they were more in the kind no, of three it, to four, but okay. It, it, it's not an inconsistent <coughs> number with. It, but the whole point is... I understand really, the point. It's really out of alignment it's, with it's, us. It's an, you know, everyone else is trying to maintain budgets and keep budgets low, and they just willy-nilly, 5%, 4%, 5%, doesn't matter, you know, because we have no ability not to pay it. You know, I get you it. Ta you, get take what you, you take our bill and you pay it and you walk away happy. That's the, the system of government. That's the way it's worked. <laughs> and there's no. And if you want to see it, page two actually has the graph that shows the increase. I mean, Don's right. It's been pretty fun. I mean, we, we get a good service from the Com Cumberland County. I mean, uh, as far as uh, the sheriff, police, the sheriff, I have no problem. Police, with jails, yeah. uh, register of deeds. I mean, uh, you, you can't. But, you know, they also got into other areas that they probably shouldn't have, like, assessing. Uh, we don't use them, but you know we're paying for uh, for other towns. Uh, that's part of their, you know, they do <coughs> assessing for other towns. So um, I'm not saying that we should go with them, but uh, dispatch is great, works great. We save a ton of money with them. So uh, I don't like the increase, but there's nothing we can do. until we change the people that represent us. Are, Kathy, are we able to get a breakdown of what uh, made up that 4.99, or like whatever oh, percentage sure. increase? Oh, oh yeah, definitely. Like where, where, did where did the increased funds go? Um, I, I would think so. I, I, I'm pretty sure I could get a paragraph out of them that, that I mean, I can get the entire line by line budget oh, if you really want the whole, the whole okay. thing. But I'm Be pretty sure I can get an overview of what what the increases were. Okay. Any other questions on county tax? 
All right. All right. See you later. Um, I'm sorry. Are we done with CIP with you guys? Yeah. Was there a correction from your cover letter and the numbers in the CIP spreadsheet? Okay. What needs to be what needs to be updated? Page 46. I think that's what they're talking about. Why not? That's why we're talking to you. It has no substance in the fact. It has no substance in the fact because we're not going to change it anyway. Because they can take it out of their unallocated piece of budget. That's all they get. Are you good? system that says, I understand what drove your question now, about half of it now, half of it later. I get that now. Um, thought, basically, because yeah, it's listed it here and not there. We are, we are. Half of it will come from our CIP balance. Okay. The other half comes okay. from appropriation. That's that's the clarification. So this is all going to take take care of done? Yes, yes. Done. So the that makes it the is, nine. Is in the town budget, it shows just 75000 for the department CIP. Not, can you go to the mic, please? In the cover sheet for the fire department and in the CIP budget, we you? put the total appropriation <laughs> for this year to be 120, but in the town budget, it only shows as 75. Okay. So it was short 45,000. Uh, but so we, we, weren't, we weren't in agreement oh, so oh, oh, that we were going to reflect it since the since you're under in their paperwork it shows it two different ways is what I'm saying Kathy. Mm -hmm. So so it's showing ninety thousand for the sum of forty five for half and remaining forty five from CIP. From CIP. On this, yes. Correct. And yep. then what they do at town CIP. Seventy five for the revenue rescue. Seventy five to the fire department. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Seventy five goes in the rescue reserve, which is just an automatic thing. That's uh, Total and appropriation you, of 120 for the year. We were on our toes or not? And when we clearly yeah, we were not yeah. accepting yeah. Teresa. So, <laughs> so what? So you were the only one that were on that your that toes. Well, well, I, I, I think yes, if that's does. such a problem, why okay. are they taking a whole year to fix it? You know, like half now oh. and then half next year. And I'm like, that doesn't we'll, make sense. We'll we'll meet with the fire department tomorrow. Oh, I thought. We don't think oh, there's any budgetary change that needs to be made I'm here in the document. Literally going, okay, you're doing but half this year, half this year, you got a whole year of problems still. Yeah. Tomorrow. So good. All right. So okay. it's getting fixed now. Thank you. Okay. 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 Ok
What was her name? I can't remember. She was a pilgrim. Clark. Cross. Cross. Yeah. yeah, the workers' comp piece. We, we, we really don't have the any choice. The carrier stayed the same. The carrier yeah. stayed the same because that's there's yeah. really only one game that we can play in, and that and that is Memek. Yeah. Um, but for the the um, the other piece, the property casualty. I mean, that's really the result of our claims history, and also the result of we added a, a ton of new vehicles this year too. Heavy trucks. Yeah. Big trucks. Cloud trucks. Right. We acquired three um, so-called wheeler plow trucks used from the um, from Vermont and then we also purchased a new truck of that same stature and, and then we have a one ton truck and we have new fire trucks and we new have loader. the new front end loader new. so we have a number of pieces of rolling equipment that are expensive and either new or so relatively new. <laughs> That's the property cash. That's the property cash yeah. yeah. So so I mean, we really did upscale our fleet significantly, most notably in public works for the snow operations, which we had planned on doing, and we did it under budget, under what we'd said we'd do it for, so mm -hmm. slightly under budget. But it does result in you own this stuff now; you have to insure it. Right. <laughs> we knew that going in. So we knew right. that going in, right? Any other questions on insurance? Bob, one quick work. Yes. Go ahead. Um, on the um, on the workers' comp, I mean, a 28 percent increase. The question comes, and that's just for the year. It's going to be a long time before we lose that again. Is there anything we can be doing in terms of training, or else? I don't know what the worker comp uh, claims were, but is there anything that we could be doing to make sure that we avoid additional? Adi additionally, besides the claims, we also have increased in payroll because the workers' comp comes directly from the payroll. And then after the year is finished, they come in and audit it, and then they categorize everybody's job into the different uh, risk pools. So, um, so we do have the in, and every year we're increasing pay, payroll because we're adding positions. Mm -hmm. But we actually did have Memet came out to us this year and went over uh, some of our risk items, and and we are going to work with them on training. Okay. Yeah. So we have, you know, they, they, they have various uh, training materials, uh, videos that we can watch, and, uh, you know, we, we also have webinars and other things we can do and take, and so... He actually came out and looked at everything, too, yeah, didn't no. he? He came out and looked at everything and did an assessment to look at risk and factors where improvement could be made, so the answer is yes. Okay. Yeah, May I ask where the worker and workman's comp, in, from what department the workman's comp um, claims came from? Um, fire. Okay. And there, there are some other claims in, in PW too. So the biggest high risk areas are where we get our, where, 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 where we get claims from. <laughs> the town office, low risk. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Paper cuts. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say, Memek does a good job of of coming and doing training you and things like that. And so you're it's one of the, and, and it's all part of their it's all part of their fees. So it's one of those. If, if, right. if you can, if you can get them to come in and do things, uh, it's you might as well. You yeah. might as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, and they've they've got they've got experts in a lot of areas. So <coughs> make use of what you can get. Anyone else? Seeing none. Let's go right down to revenues on page six and seven. So the principal areas there are estimated auto excise tax collections are increasing by 50,000, um, estimated boat excise collections by 25,000, CEO, which we touched on earlier, fee expectation 13,000, and then uh, a decrease in fire rescue revenue of 20,000. It's kind of the, the fire, even in my short tenure here, they're, they're kind of cyclical. So basically I'm just looking at the last 12 month period to make those projections. So we try to track as closely as we can actuals, in other words. Yes. And, you know, take an estimate off actuals. I guess they, they uh, Bruce, uh, oh, yeah. sorry. Okay. <laughs> or maybe Kathy can better, but our number of runs are increasing each year. 
No. Correct. They fluctuate. No. So I last year was actually down. down. Oh, good. Last year. That was good. Last oh, year okay. was down. So we've done one of these. Okay. And, yeah. So that would that would bear that out then. Okay. Correct. So because I, I was thinking we were still on that slope that was running this way. Well, part of it's also going to reflect the more uh, community medic approach, if you will, where we actually do a lot of stuff in the field and we don't always uh, transport patients. So someone with diabetic, diabetic reaction, we can fix that in the field mm -hmm. often, and there's not a lot of billing that can be had uh, after the fact. But Medicare is coming up with some new changes in law shortly. Uh, we anticipate them in the next year. That will allow us to bill for a lot of those very things that we, we can't now, so no transport type incidents. Okay, Don. Um, and yet he has more. I have a little bit more here if you want some other revenue information. That is, uh, you know, for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 18, we ended up with uh, revenues exceeding budget pro projections by 395000 The largest components of, of that were positive variances and excise tax of 150. That tells you something about the robust economy we have continued to enjoy in Raymond. Interest in taxes of 25,000. That tells you something else. Uh, miscellaneous income 74,000, and property taxes 146,000. So we we had a, I think a very strong, you know, past year, and and uh, so so uh, you know Raymond throughout the so-called recessionary time and into the present day has continued to enjoy a growth environment, which is good news. A lot of, a lot of towns, that's not true. Uh, we're showing under perpetual care, zero for 18. That's just because it, the perpetual care 4,000 is basically what gets transferred from the cemetery trust funds into the general fund every year. Okay. So I, I just haven't done it. No, oh, okay. So it's the, I, I, my concern is that that was, you know, that that's under trust and whatnot, so that you know, so that should be automatic. Right. Yeah. Okay. No, I actually. So it just hasn't it. just hasn't come across yet for eighteen. Okay. The other thing is we had about a six point five million dollar increase in valuation last year. We're expecting something similar this year, which is going to generate, you know, order of magnitude eighty thousand in additional taxes. That's not in this proposal. So so that's more good news, I think. Is there a line here for uh, cemetery plot sales? No, because those go um, directly into the trust fund plot sales. So where would it show up in our paperwork? It wouldn't because we don't budget it and we don't. Um, so when it comes through the door, it goes directly into the trust fund. And from the trust funds every year through the budgetary process, we appropriate from the trust funds the four grand every year. I mean, that's just been the history is, is four grand. May I ask what the balance is in the trust fund? Well, that would be a good question. Um, <laughs> you don't have to get it right this moment. Okay, that good. Sometime would be great. No, yeah, I, I can do that, sure. Thank you. Um, undesignated fund balance. Yeah. So people want to know about that. So we have uh, $2.1 which exceeds our policy by 318,000, and there is zero fund balance in this budget as well, which is something else that you know could be, and has been in the past, uh, metered in for major non-recurring capital expenditures. But we did not do that in this draft. So no new growth revenue, no fund balance. So you can go to zero and beyond if that's where you want to go, but we don't think that's where we, we should be going. Um, yeah. We have parking tickets issued I in town. That. We do. We, we, we actually have a parking ticket officer. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> Who do you think? <laughs> oh, Nathan. oh, that's good. <laughs> Constable, <laughs> Na Constable, Constable Nathan. Yeah. All right. Well, nobody's going to mess with them at least. <laughs> Does he actually no, do people, it? No, people have messed with <laughs> him actually. <laughs> okay. Where? At, at, oh, Raymond, at Raymond Beach. Good to know. Uh, yeah. get more out of that account. Okay. He, he left his truck running one time when he was issuing tickets, and somebody went and locked it with it running. I did not do that. <laughs> yeah, so, so people have messed with Nathan, but not face-to-face. -face. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on revenue, please? 
better than it looks. Okay, let's go to the TIFF, page 25. So, uh, well, I'll, I'll start and then you can jump in. Okay. The, pro the proposed budget uses all of the accumulated TIF reserve funds of 32,000. We're moving 75,000 in roads and 35,000 in playgrounds to the CIP. And somebody, was it Brian? I can't remember now, re requesting $100,000 to start a revaluation reserve. I'm not sure where we're going to be on a revaluation, but I would think absolutely minimum is going to be in the 300 range. It could be, could be 500, but it will be money well spent to start down the road towards the reval. Um, you know, we're starting now in the, because the assessor has told us that, you know, we've gone a, a long, long time. I, I think it's more like 15 years. I was thinking 10, but maybe more like 15 I years. I think it was like 10 or 15, between 10 12, and 15. 12. Okay, so it's between the two there. Yeah. So, so anyway, it's, uh, we were talking about that before the meeting, but it's, um, so it's been a, been a long time, longer than, than it would be a normal interval for a town. And so that speaks to the quality of the original work, um, which I think was, was relatively good. And it also speaks to the fact that the recession did slow down growth somewhat. I have a question, Don. Um, there has been talks and research on solar energy. Uh, where would we, if we were to consider that, where would it come in our budget? Well, that's on my, on my list of topics here, and that would be a sub. <laughs> if the selectmen chose to go forward, which we had a postponement because of weather, and then our chair wanted everybody to be there for this important discussion. So when it comes up on the agenda on March 19th, if the board elected to go forward, it would have to be a, a supplemental appropriation. It's not in the budget. Okay. And, and there's multiple ways to, to do it. I mean, if, if they decide to do it, there's different, different models. Rolf? Um, has Kurt looked at what the amount available in the TIF will be based on the county saying that they're doing that 7.7% increase in valuation on us, which should increase some of those, which should throw us flow some additional funds into the TIF account. Also with the TIF, we do, we suffer from the, um, the uh, Betty tax, which is, do you have to depreciate all that equipment each year too, so mm -hmm. you get two opposing, two opposing forces, yeah. you've got the decrease in the, in the equipment, but you've got the increased valuation in the real estate. Um, so, uh, has he looked at it's a question? I don't know. I don't know. Typically, don't he looks at that around the time when, we, when we're gonna trying to set the mill rate. But exactly. But it would be nice to know, if have him look at that when, sooner rather than later so we can see where, where it's going to end up. If we have any free board there. Okay. Because whatever we can do in there saves us in other right. areas. Okay. Any other TIF questions? Seeing none. Administration, page 10. Okay. Yeah, so we had a, a retirement. Our part time counter person G and clerk and GA administrator, Alice Hamilton, uh, retired last Friday. And we, we had her in the budget at three days. I mean, we had, we had her in the budget, yeah, at three days, but she was working more like uh, two. two. And so now we're saying we'd like to move that position to a full-time position, a four-day position. And um, so that's, that's a change in the, in the administration budget. Um, MMA is, is in the budget as a discussion point at 76.59. And... Um, the other piece, the other. I don't think there was really any. Those are basically the, the drivers, I the guess. The big ones. The bigger ones. Mr. Chairman, there is one piece I'd like to bring up if we could. Um, there is one piece of legislation before that's uh, before committee right now 
that seems to be gaining some momentum, and that's to go back to a presidential primary instead of having a presidential caucus. And if that comes to be, we could have another election next March. And that's not something I've put in the budget. So I'm just, I wanted everyone to be aware of that. I can't really budget on something that doesn't exist yet, but I did want people to be aware that that's something that seems to be in the offing. You don't need an unfunded mandate, do you? No, the state wouldn't do an unfunded mandate to us ever. Okay. It's the cost of the election. But we had decided that if we needed to cross that bridge, we would do that at the... Um, the, the cost would be less than most elections, I believe, because we would be able, it would be one ballot pretty much. We would probably, well, no, if the state's running it, we'll do the machine. So the state would have the cost of the machine and have the cost of, of programming the machine and the cost of the ballots. So, but our cost would be for sending out the absentees, for staffing the election. Again, it's what should be, it'll be a, I think it would be a fairly high turnout. I would hope it would be, uh, but it's an odd time of year. People aren't used to it. It's one of those where I'd have to plan high and maybe come in low. What's your high so. number? Pardon? What's your high number? I don't know. We've never done one. Okay. So I, I really, it would be a crapshoot for me to try and figure out how big this would be. I know the last uh, caucus was incredible, at least the Republican caucus was very highly uh, attended. The Democratic wasn't quite as high. The, the caucus before that, it was the other way around. So it depends on the candidates, it depends on a lot of things. Well, what was 16? What was, what was, what was, the, what was mm -hmm. the figure for the gubernatorial? What, what, was your, what was your figure for that? Figure for, you mean the number of turnout? No, cost. Cost. <coughs> that is. June, November. Roughly $2,000. Okay, so I mean, if we if we if we had to if we had to eat that someplace we could that was the idea yes yeah. <laughs> oh yeah I just wanted I just wanted folks to be aware of it yeah. because that may be something that will be coming up and if it is then the budget figure next year will definitely increase any other questions on administration assessing page 12 please Okay, you got a, a decrease due to completion of software uh, upgrade if you don't factor the 100K for the reval. Any questions? And the other thing, I would, if I could say something about, I, I'll check this with the county, but I believe that county assessing program that Dana referenced is mostly funded through the users of the service. I'm sure that as any county service would be, it, uh, you know, there is probably some component of county support. But I want to say on record, we've been really happy with Kurt LaBelle. His price is competitive. His work is, in my mind, superior. Mm -hmm. And there would be no, when there are cost advantages, we would certainly look at the county. But the towns, it's been a mixed bag. Some towns have thought it's okay. Other towns have withdrawn. Some towns say it's not so okay. We have a good contract assessor at a reasonable price. Brian. Um, Don, is the software, uh, the $9,700 uh, budget item for 2020, is that going to be kind of the norm going forward now? Have we gotten through that hump of the, of the new software and now it's yes. more of a maintenance? Yeah, they actually just finished it like a couple of weeks ago. And it'll just go back down to the the licensing fee that we pay every you know, there's still an increase. Yeah. If you look at the eighteen actual to the right. twenty budget. Okay. So. But around around that ten thousand dollars will be the new norm then. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any other assessing questions? Community de development page sixteen. It's just the uh, Lake Region bus and apparently uh, Kathy, and I think it's the right decision. I think I may have been involved somehow too, but 
and that is that it's a provider agency, and so they're coming next time. They're all coming next time. They're all coming next time. It makes sense to do them all together. And I think I, I think I got involved in notifying them, but anyway, they've been notified. I did. Well, you did it. Okay. We talked about it anyhow. Talked about the logic of having one separate from the rest, and that's not where we want to be. So that's it, folks. It's, it's quite a departure from what we decided upon last year for funding for the bus. Oh, well, that's, that's, just oh, that was, that's, that's their that's request. request. That's their request. request. That's no. their request. Okay. Their request. Thank you. <laughs> right. And on something that's been previously funded, we would put in their initiated request. Yeah. We, we wouldn't pre-cut it, if you know what I mean. Right. Okay. So, Don, at the, or, sorry, Mr. Yeah, right. Chair, at the next meeting, then, the agency submissions of Regional Transportation American Legion, all of those folks have been invited. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And has anybody whose agency yes, submissions were not included in the budget, were any of those invited? Yes, and they're in the book. They're, they're okay. in there for you to see. Okay, and they, but they have been invited to come in. Oh, oh no, 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 oh, okay. no, no, we didn't, if we didn't, if we didn't put them in the budget book, they haven't been invited. Okay. But they're put in the book so you can see who right. made a request and didn't get okay. funded or didn't get recommended for funding. They certainly could be added, but we didn't put them in. That's right. Thank you. And the other thing, um, I kind of, I, I don't know how well I answered the, at the beginning, the MMA question. I, I wasn't expecting that, that oh, question. So, 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 Are we still in the But. Sorry. You all set? Um, okay. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Wait, no, okay. I'll hold that thought. Go ahead. Set. Set. Okay, he's talking to yourself. Um, any comment from the Budget Finance Committee? Any comment from the Select Board? Any comment from the public? Louise, please. I'll make it short. Louise. Louise Lester Tent, Hartley Lane. I'm going to reiterate what I did in my letter which is to encourage you to go with MMA. Uh, I was town clerk for a few years. And at the time that we left MMA, I found that my job was more difficult. Um, the ability to call MMA and have answers que answered questions or to go to their trainings at a reduced price from what we are pre presently paying. Um, was, was wonderful. Um, I could call an attorney up there with a question. And literally, with, at that moment, if not sometime during the day, I'd get a reply. Once we left MMA, if I had a question, I wasn't about to call our town attorney at $250 or $350 an hour, whatever it is that we pay them. Um, so what I would do, I'd call one of my fellow clerks and ask them to MMA call and then get back to me with the answer, which was very embarrassing. I did not want to go into a situation ignorant. So I did my best to get the best answer that I could to the question that was coming to me, whether it was elections or something else. Um, so again, I can't encourage you enough to keep MMA in our budget. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. Any other public comment? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Stay tuned for our next meeting on March 12th. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. So, uh,